Hola, muy buenos días eh, a todos. Es un placer eh, desde el Cano eh, poder estar hoy en torno a esta mesa para hablar con Fabio Panetta y distinguidos eh, panelistas que presentaré inmediatamente sobre el euro digital, eh, uno de los temas eh, muy, muy importantes. Eh, eh, voy a pasarme a inglés porque la, la conversación la vamos a tener en inglés a lo largo de, de, esta, de esta mañana. Hello, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thanks especially to Fabio Panetta uh, to 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 accept for help for accepting our invitation today to discuss in this group of the trabajo about the Euro Digital. As you know, uh, Fabio Panetta is a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank, uh, and he is going to 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 make uh, some introductory remarks on the issue that we are going to discuss in today. Afterwards, we will have uh, four panelists uh, which will, will take, uh, take uh, the, some questions and maybe make their points uh, to, to, to this uh, turnaround. Uh, uh, we, we have Margarita Delgado, which uh, is the Deputy Governor in Bank of Spain. We have Santiago Fernández de Liz, uh, which is the Head of Regulation of BBA. Uh, we have Fanny Solano, which is the head of digital retail and market regulation and implementation in Caixa Bank. We have Alejandra Kindelan, head of research and public policy at Banco Santander, and Carlos Cuerpo, which is the Secretary General of the Treasury and International Financing in the Spanish government. The way we are going to proceed, it's just uh, I will give the floor to Fabio in a few minutes. Uh, you in the audience can send us your questions by email. Uh, the email address is activities arroba realcano dot, uh, punto org. Um, uh, without uh, any more uh, delay, uh, we, we, we are going to state. Fabio, thank you again for being here and you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, President Dia Jose Juan, uh, for your uh, kind invitation. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to, to uh, and honored to have the opportunity to uh, speak at uh, uh, El Cano, uh, an institute that enjoys a very high reputation, not only in Spain, but also internationally. I'm also, I'm also pleased to see um, many uh, distinguished colleagues and friends, uh, Carlos, Margarita, and uh, many others, but it's a pleasure to, to get together from time to time. Uh, it has become more difficult given the situation, but it, it's a pleasure when we can get together. Uh, today, I will uh, address um, a topic that has become uh, prominent in the public uh, debate uh, in Europe, but also uh, more broadly, uh, globally. I, I'm sure that you are aware of the fact that the, the uh, major central banks are working for the possible uh, introduction of the so-called uh, central bank digital currencies, that is, a digital means of payment issued by the central bank. Today we have a physical means of payment issued by the central bank, which is cash made in paper. In the future, we might have digital uh, means of payment. And uh, this is true, of course, for the ECB, which is working with the national central banks of the euro system for the possible introduction of what we have called digital euro but it is also true uh, uh 
in other jurisdictions, the uh, Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, uh, the People's Bank of China, which by the way is the most advanced central bank in, in, uh, in this field, are also working for the possible introduction of their own uh, digital means of payment. Now, uh, one question has uh, emerged uh, very you know, prominently in the public debate, and it's a question that you will be surprised that uh, has not emerged and has not been uh, uh, addressed before. Uh, why do we need a central bank digital currency? But a fundamental question. Why uh, uh, should the central bank issue a digital means of payment? After all, we already have um, highly efficient private digital means of payment issued by, by companies around the world. So why should we bother with uh, a, a means of payment issued by the central bank, which is in general not in the business of issuing a retail means of payment. The only retail means of payment we issue is cash, but cash is a totally different story. Cash does not require any interaction with uh, the users. A digital means of payment is a totally different animal. Well, <clears throat> this question has become prominent. There are, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, people who are skeptical of vaccines. We have people who are skeptical of uh, digital currencies. Today, I will uh, uh, argue uh, that the availability of uh, uh, digital money, of public sovereign digital money is necessary. It is an essential uh, condition to guarantee confidence in private money and to guarantee the smooth functioning of the payment and financial system. I will uh, read a, a summary of a speech that has been published five minutes, seven minutes ago on the website of the ECB, in which in more elaborate way, uh, I will uh, uh, make my case. I will give you uh, a summary because I want to leave sufficient space for, space for the subsequent um, Q&A session, which is the most uh, interesting part of any discussion. So the ongoing digitalization of our economy is leading to far reaching changes in many areas of our lives. Payments are no exception. Innovative forms of private digital money are emerging in response to changing needs, which are transforming how we pay and the payment landscape more broadly. These developments touch at the core of central banks' mandates as issuers of sovereign money. And central banks around the world are looking for ways to respond. The ECB is exploring whether to issue a digital euro. This is the name that we have given to our digital currency digital euro. That is a digital form of central bank money for people and businesses to use in retail payments. So day-to-day -day payments. It has been argued that such a central bank digital currency, if issued, would be redundant. This is the uh, view that some have uh, proposed. Redundant given the vast supply, the vast supply of private digital monies available, such as bank deposits, credit cards, electronic money, and mobile applications. Today, I would like to argue that actually monetary stability and the smooth functioning of payment of the payment system ultimately depends on everyone being able to widely access and use sovereign money. And there is no reason why this should not hold true in the digital era. But this requires central banks to evolve alongside changing technologies, payment habits, and financial ecosystems. And let me now explain why. People's confidence in private money is underpinned by its convertibility on a one-to-one -one basis with the safest form of money in the economy, central bank money, the monetary anchor. Central bank money is the only money whose face value is intrinsically guaranteed in the economy. Private issuers have to rely on convertibility as their money is exposed to operational, credit, liquidity, and market risks. These risks are reduced through public policy safeguards such as financial supervision, capital requirements, and deposit insurance. Convertibility at par provides confidence in private money because it reassures us regarding its ultimate value and its usability in payments. For example, when we go to our bank's cash machine and convert our deposits into an equivalent amount of cash, we are safe in the knowledge that our deposits have kept their value. 
By going to a cash machine on a recurring basis and withdrawing cash each time, we build confidence that this will continue to happen in the future. And we agree to store and use our money through private intermediaries because we are ultimately reassured that we will get cash if we ask for it. We are therefore confident that we will be able to make payments even if our money cannot be used directly in its private form. Runs on private money start when it's com this confidence, the confidence in convertibility, disappears, triggering a flight to safety. Convertibility into central bank money is therefore necessary for confidence in private money as both a means of payment and a store of value. <clears throat> By providing a monetary anchor, central bank money plays a key role in maintaining a well-functioning payment system, financial stability, and ultimately trust in the currency. This, in turn, is a precondition for preserving the transmission of monetary policy, and hence for protecting the value of money. But today, we do have access to central bank money in the form of cash, banknotes. The importance of cash in payments is declining, however, as people increasingly prefer to pay digitally and shop online. Almost half of Euro area consumers prefer to pay ca with cashless means of payments, such as cards. Internet sales in the Euro area have doubled since 2015. And of course, if you buy online, you cannot pay with cash. Cash is increasingly used as a store of value and decreasingly as a means of payment, a trend that the pandemic has accelerated. Only about 20% of the cash stock is now used for payment transactions, down from 35% uh, 15 years ago. If these trends were to persist, cash would end up losing its central role. Just as the postage stamp lost much of its usefulness with the arrival of the internet and email, so too would cash lose relevance in a digital economy. The upshot is that in this, if this scenario were to materialize, it would weaken the effectiveness of central bank money as a monetary anchor. Even central banks pledged to continue to supply cash would do little to guarantee that cash would remain an effective anchor if there was insufficient demand for it as a means of payment. While banks could continue to hold central bank money in the form of reserves, this may not prove sufficient to fully preserve the monetary anchor role of central bank money. People would be unable to use central bank money as means of exchange and would thus have little incentive to hold it. This would weaken also the unit of account role of sovereign money. Some have suggested that innovative private payment solutions, such as stable coins, could, if properly regulated, make central bank digital currencies superfluous. But confidence in stable coins also depends on convertibility with central bank money. Unless stable coin issuers are granted access to the central bank balance sheet. However, this would amount to outsourcing the provision of central bank money to stable coin issuers and risking a corresponding reduction in monetary sovereignty. We will not do it. Without central bank money to provide an un undisputed monetary anchor, people would have to monitor the safety of private money issuers in order to value each form of money, undermining the singleness of the currency. Indeed, there were recurrent crises in the past when different forms of private money coexisted, coexisted in the absence of sovereign money, such as during the free banking uh, episodes of the past centuries. History shows that financial stability and public trust in money requires, uh, require a widely used public money alongside private monies. As people want to use cash more and more as a store of value rather than a means of payment, having a digital euro would enable them to continue using central bank money as a means of exchange in the digital era. A digital euro and cash would complement each other and ensure that central bank money remains a monetary anchor for the payment ecosystem and continues to serve as a means of exchange, a store of value and a unit of account. 
for this to come about, a large share of the population would need to use the digital euro on a regular basis. It would not necessarily, it would not be necessary, uh, it won't be necessary for them to use the digital euro for most of their day-to-day -day payments. What matters is that such regular use would give people the confidence that they can always use the digital euro for payments if they wanted to do so. To this end, a digital euro would have to be designed in a way that makes it attractive enough to be widely used as a means of payment, but at the same time prevents it becoming so successful as a store of value that it crowds out private money and increases the risk of bank runs. The previous discussion suggests that in a digital world, central bank digital currencies are necessary to guarantee the smooth functioning of the payment market, especially in periods of crisis. But this does not mean that their success should be taken for granted. So what are the conditions for success? Besides having an intrinsic appeal, a successful digital euro would need to be widely accessible and usable. In other words, while people would find the digital euro attractive because of its unique property as the only riskless digital form of money, they would also need to be able to use it easily wherever they can pay digitally. Consumers will only use a digital euro if merchants are accepted, and merchants will want to be reassured that consumers want to use it. Intermediaries, in turn, will only follow suit if there is compelling evidence that the benefits of distributing a digital euro outweighs the cost of doing so. Developing a convincing value proposition for all stakeholders is therefore critical for the success of the digital euro. This is a key part of the investigation phase of the digital euro project that the ECB started in October. For consumers, the digital euro would offer a cost-free and convenient way to pay digitally anywhere in the euro area. It would also increase privacy in digital payments. Why? Because uh, as a public and independent institution, the ECB, central banks in general, the euro system have no interest in monetizing users' payment data. The central bank could only process this data to the extent necessary for the functions of the digital euro in full compliance with public interest objectives and EU legislation. For merchants and small businesses, a digital euro will be an additional means to receive customer payments through the instant reception of risk-free money. Moreover, a digital euro could contain the cost of payments through its potential to mitigate the market power of dominant digital payment providers. The digital euro should not be seen as a competitor to digital payment services offered by the private sector. Intermediaries could play an integral, I, I, I mean, they should play, they will play an integral role in the onboarding and provision of front end services to ensure a pan European reach. They would have the opportunity to distribute the safest and most liquid form of money, and they could develop new services with digital euro inside, thereby generating additional revenues. For instance, they could provide credit facilities to digital euro users or innovative value added services in the form of automated or conditional payments. This would help level the playing field by making it easier for banks, including the small ones. And fintechs to compete with big tech firms, which are already expanding into payments and financial services. It would support the competitiveness of European payments, making them cheaper and more efficient for users. Finally, by providing a fast, cheap and safe digital means of payment, a digital euro would support the euro's international role and Europe's autonomy in global payments. Making it accessible to non-residents and interoperable with other central bank digital currencies could facilitate cross-border payments which are currently fraught with high costs, low speed, and limited access. Let me conclude. Central bank money plays a crucial role in the payment system and the financial sector as a whole. <clears throat> it provides the reference value for all other forms of money in the economy, underpinning confidence in the currency. 
in financial stability and in the smooth functioning of the payment system. It is also necessary for preserving the transmission of monetary policy, hence for protecting the value of money and monetary sovereignty. Central banks must prepare for a digital future in which demand for cash as a medium of exchange may weaken. This requires complementing the convertibility of private money into cash by convertibility into central bank digital currency. This is the primary reason why the ECB would issue a digital euro. Now that people are increasingly shifting towards digital payments, we need to ensure that they can readily access and use central bank money in digital form as well. We are working to make the digital euro an attractive means of payment for everyone, house, firms, merchants and intermediaries alike. This would, will allow the digital euro to play its intended role as the necessary monetary anchor for the digital year. Thank you for your attention and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio, for this splendid uh, address. I think it's a very illuminating comment. And my takeaway are two. Uh, on the one hand, that we are talking about something that is going to take a lot of our thoughts in the, in the, in the months to come. And your clear uh, idea of putting the, the focus on two very important issues, how we uh, keep trust of the public and how we uh, secure the one-to-one -one compatibility between private money and digital money. It's really a key point uh, to the development of the, 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 the digitalization and the efficient work of the payment system. The second, that is even more important, it's that if we, don't have, we are not able to create this anchor on a central or a digital, digital euro, uh, we risk to, to lose the effectiveness of the transmission of monetary policy. And therefore, these two ideas of efficiency of the transmission of monetary policy and, tr and trust are uh, at the core of what we are going to see in the, in the months to come. Uh, we, we are going to, to, to open now the discussion to the other member of the panel, and I am going to ask uh, Margarita from Deputy Governor of the Bank of Spain, Margarita Delgado, to make the her address. Margarita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jose Juan. It's a real pleasure to be here in, in, in the Real Instituto Elcano um, with these um, distinguished uh, speakers. And of course, it's always a pleasure to have here Fabio together and, and around the same table, listening to him, who is the, the real responsible and the promoter and the sponsor. I know that of the uh, euro digital euro in in the euro system so thanks a lot uh, fabio and thanks of course uh, to uh, jose juan for organizing this um i think this is one of the hottest topics uh, probably together with um, let's say esg um, uh, risks and, and problems um, that we have in our place uh, nowadays so um i think I, I i can agree of course i mean with fabio uh we've listened to to, to him explaining how fundamental a digital euro would be for preserving both, of course, monetary stability and the smooth functioning of the payment system. So I think this is really uh, relevant. And of course, due to the importance of effectiveness of central bank money as monetary anchor. Um, I think he has also touched upon a very critical issues um, um, of the digital euro project in order to have it, uh, to have um, a successful one, right? So if you allow me, I would like to complement his intervention with maybe a broader reflection on how the digital euro could um, best uh, maybe potentially fit into this current financial ecosystem, which is probably key uh, nowadays. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, um, when deciding, uh, designing a digital euro, um, I, I believe that the central banks uh, should first and foremost, of course, consider adopting a forward-looking strategy. And, and I really personally think that the, that the digital uh, euro um, is, uh, 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 is probably not a current and urgent uh, um, ne necessity uh, uh, of the European society. If you uh, go around the streets of Madrid and, and ask uh, people, probably this is not one of the 
major needs uh, nowadays. But for me, this is more a strategic decision of the central banks. Of course, we need, as central bankers, we need to explore the opportunities that a digital euro um, could potentially bring to us as central bankers and also um, in order to allow us and, and help us comply with our objectives as, as central bankers. Of course, we can't deny digitalization. Um, uh, we know that it, this is a relentless uh, process uh, that is affecting all, all aspects of the financial system, including, of course, uh, payment systems. So, um, therefore, in my opinion, uh, we should, shouldn't disregard the opportunities that, the, the, that lie ahead of us and recognize the fact that digitalization is likely to change the present status quo of the financial system. And this is, to me, something that mm, very obvious and we cannot uh, avoid it. So against uh, this backdrop, um, uh, a CBDC could be one of uh, many useful allies uh, to support an orderly transition to the new, to the new scenario. So um, we, we see that new players are emerging and they will emerge even further. And digital processes, of course, will be more frequent in our day-to-day uh, -day business and banks' uh, business and, and, and many other players. But of course, uh, there is a transition, uh, and, and in this transition to the new financial um, ecosystem, um, we cannot forget, um, in my opinion, the fundamental pillars of uh, our financial system. Um, in my view, a future digital euro uh, should probably exhibit features that promote more efficiency, as uh, Fabio mentioned, Mm, inclusiveness and innovative uh, payments, while safeguarding uh, at the same time both, as already mentioned, monetary and financial stability, of course, as critical elements of our uh, mandate, of central bank's uh, mandate. Um, so I really agree that um, a digital euro should, should serve as an effective link between private means of payments and central bank money, as Fabio already suggested. So I think that digital euro uh, shall have features that uh, um, bring uh, flexibility to accommodate the, this ever changing uh, demands in the market. And of course, to ensure, to make sure that um, this uh, remains up to date. So maybe one, one example, I think uh, uh, Fabio already uh, mentioned it uh, with the different words. Um, one good example of this flexibility could be uh, the programmability, uh, which uh, certain uh, new technologies, uh, of course, support. Um, I think that pro programmability offers the possibility to add useful uh, functionalities to a CBDC and to the digital euro, for, of course, and the, therefore will contribute to make it more attractive to, to, to users. So, of course, we need to design a very appealing uh, digital euro in order to set the conditions for this success in, in addition to other features uh, as accessibility. So, when, when making the choices about the digital euro design, um, even if we decide to start slow or in a phased in manner, um, we must be particularly careful not to limit the deployment of any potential options. Um, that might be uh, uh, relevant at a later, later stage. So on top of this, maybe good communication uh, will be essential to properly manage expectations, uh, identify opportunities uh, for private innovation and avoid misunderstandings that may jeopardize our project. Um, so um, again, um, coming back to my idea that um, uh, we need to pay attention to the fact that uh, the digital euro uh, will operate in a pre-existing environment. Um, of course, we need to be very careful because uh, the digital euro will join an already established playground with different stakeholders playing multiple roles and responsibilities. So probably um, central banks, we will need to take into account the role uh, that uh, the current intermediaries um, play now and factor in the potential benefits uh, of this private-public uh, collaboration. So in my view, 
um, um, uh, this will require three key uh, elements. Uh, first, we will need to, um, uh, to take a, a very close look to the respective strengths of the different uh, um, stakeholders, the different parties uh, involved in this process. Secondly, um, the considerations on our particular goals as central bankers. Um, probably we are likely to be different from those uh, other regions uh, with similar CBDC initiatives because we probably have different uh, goals as uh, central bankers in, in Europe. And thirdly, uh, the practical challenges uh, uh, associated to the different possible routes. So um, I think that this speaks in favor of having a very complex uh, project plan, plan uh, with um, a lot of market dialogue and input uh, from the different fundamental pillars uh, in order to guarantee the, the acceptance of the different stakeholders. So I think that the approach uh, followed by the, by the ECB and the Euro system is, in my view, exemplary. And, and it has already foreseen various types of uh, uh, contact structures. So as a conclusion, let me just uh, highlight, uh, highlight um, the uh, ambitions of two key questions. First, uh, uh, the actual success of the digital euro uh, relies on how it reflects the needs of the society. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think we should and uh, we need to consider the current strengths that intermediaries might contribute uh, uh, to this project and take advantage of them. I think that uh, being proactive on, on that uh, might really add value uh, given that the industry is already working on the digitalization of payment systems. So I think we cannot lag behind uh, um, the digitalization pro process and we are a kind of uh, project in engineers. So uh, we are asked, asked to listen to our respective communities, be responsive to their needs and potentially take bold decisions. So I look forward uh, listening to the rest of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita, for these very clear, uh, clear uh, ideas you have you have uh, bring to the table. I, I fully agree that digitalization is uh, changing the status quo of the of the payment system. That we have to be very careful. We have we don't have to forget which are the pillars of our present uh, payment system. These ideas of efficiency, innovative, and inclusiveness. I think it's really very important, and your call to be very careful of what are the needs of the society and the strengths of the intermediaries. I think are completely appropriately brought to to the conversation. Uh, I uh, I am going now to give the floor to Santiago Fernandez de Liz, which is the head of regulation of BBA. Uh, Santiago, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation, and thanks to, to Fabio for the very, very, very clear uh, presentation. So, uh, first of all, I think I, uh, I welcome the ECB report and the recent publications on, on the digital euro. I think it's, uh, they have been timely, and, and the approach they have taken is one I, I like a lot because it's very pragmatic. Is, uh, I mean, the decision will be based on the materialization of certain scenarios and uh, the idea of public-private cooperation is very much at the center of, uh, of this approach. Uh, at the same time, it is true and it is also recognized in the report that, that the design should be in accordance with the problems we want to, to address. And, uh, and uh, this design should address a number of delicate balances and trade-offs. Now, this is, I think, a, a, an issue that is coming uh, uh, every time we, we address this question. Huh? So the key question, I think, in, in Fabio's speech is first, whether cash is disappearing or not. I, I feel here the answer is a nuanced one. I mean, cash is disappearing in some countries, certainly. Mm -hmm. Sweden is a, is, is a case that is very clear. They were one of the first to start in this. In the Eurozone, the situation is a bit more nuanced, as I say, because it is, as, as Fabio said, it is decreasing the use as a means of payment, and this has been accelerated by COVID, but there is an increase in hoarding and, uh, as a store of value. It is true that we don't have very recent data post-COVID on this, so we are relying on data that are a bit, a bit old. But anyway, this has been referred to in the literature as a paradox. 
and probably it has been suggested, including in ECB publications, that it's probably related to the use of cash uh, for illegal activities and, and also for the demand of cash outside the Eurozone. The, and what are the implications of this for the Euro project? I mean, to the digital Euro project. So to me, these are unclear, but let me share with you very, I mean, preliminary thoughts. I mean, one is, so cash is moving in the opposite direction of where we want to have the digital Euro. And this is a very interesting thing because digital Euro, we want, we want it as a of payment, but not as a store of value. We want it to replace partially cash but if I understood correctly, not to replace deposits. But actually, cash is moving in the opposite direction. So the substitutability between cash and the, the digital euro in the future is decreasing. What are the implications of this? Quite frankly, I'm not sure, but, uh, but, but this may jeopardize the plans of, uh, as I said, digital euro partially replacing cash because this is less and less uh, I mean, the demand reasons are diverging in a way. No? So this is a question I would like to, to ask. I mean, whether the ECB is thinking about this kind of divergence between, between cash and the digital euro. At the same time, if it is true that cash is increasingly related to illegal activities, the competitors of cash are rather in the crypto assets, stable coins world. Now, this is another I think interesting element. Why? Because this is related to the question of privacy and anonymity. And uh, it is interesting that in the replies to the ECB report, the people answering this basically mentioned privacy as their main concern, which was a bit surprising to me, to be, to, to be frank. Uh, but it's revealing. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the digital euro will will guarantee privacy, but will certainly not offer the same anonymity as cash. No? So in a way, the digital euro will be less of a competitor than cash for, for uh, crypto assets. And this is, again, something that we have to take into account in this trade-off between privacy and the control of illegal activities, AML, etc. Then, <clears throat> One point I want to make, I mean, to me, the main rationale for using the digital euro is in the competition from stable coins and CBDCs, uh, rather than the disappearance of cash, which, as I say, is something that is, that is unclear. The reaction to this competition is not necessarily issuing uh, our own CBDC. So for stable coins, for instance, you may react by regulating stable coins, and this is something that is, is, is being done. And with other CBDCs, the competition from other CBDCs, well, you may react with cooperation, which is something that is already being done. So these cross-border issues are, are, I think, very important because we basically want the digital euro for domestic use, for domestic payments. The demand from non-residents, well, it may increase seniorage, it may have some advantages, but at the same time, it may complicate the introduction of the digital euro. Among other reasons, because there are spillovers on third countries. I'm thinking about, say, countries with a high degree of dollarization, for instance, that may face problems if they have access to a digital uh, currency that is very easy to, 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 to acquire. So here, the cross-border cooperation that we have seen in recent BIS publication is very interesting. This idea of, um, if I understood correctly, these recent publications, a network of interoperable and connected CBDCs for cross-border payments to me is very interesting and there is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, efficiency gains to be, to be achieved there. So this is a very promising area. But we will see whether central bank cooperation will prevail against competition, to be, to be frank, because, well, for instance, China is not in this, in this group of central banks. China may be the first mover. The fact that the first mover is China which is a very special country in terms of capital controls, et cetera, has a series of, of implications. Uh, so yeah, a couple of comments uh, and then I have to finish. No, the role, I mean, this is a report, the, I think makes very clear the role of private intermediaries, public sector role providing the infrastructure, private sector, the interaction with clients seems 
like a logical uh, division of, of labor, onboarding, front-end services, credit, programmable money that have been mentioned. I mean, all this can be done by the, by the private sector. Of course, intermediaries need a business case here and also need a link with uh, existing and forthcoming private payment solutions. No? And this is something that is very important in the, in the design of the digital euro. So I, I like the way uh, Fabio uh, expressed this delicate balance in his speech between designing a digital euro that is attractive enough to partially replace cash, if I understood, but not so much as to disrupt financial intermediation, but this is a very delicate uh, balance. And finally, I have a, a question rather on the, the question of the legal basis of the euro that is mentioned in the report, basically suggesting that uh, there are solutions to this, but uh, the fact is the treaty and the ECB statute refer to banknotes and coins, and there are some discussions on whether there are some legal changes that uh, should be made for the ECB to be able to reach the digital euro, and legal changes in the EU are always complicated. So uh, that's my, my final point. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, I found very interesting your, your point that is really cast disappearing and how uh, the, move, the, the money is moving in the wrong way that uh, you, we want to say from uh, being used the cash as a payment system towards a store of value and uh, these, uh, these uh, relation with the illegal activities. I think it, this is a very important issue that maybe it's going to, 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 to be raised by other panelists. But I, 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 I think that uh, Fabio, uh, as I understood uh, the first uh, address of Fabio, when you say, uh, why to create a new currency if you can regulate? And I think Fabio make a point that maybe it's interesting to, to comment uh, because the convertibility one-to-one, -one, you are only to be able to grant if you allow the in private, uh, private issues to, to, to have access to the balance sheet of central okay. banks. And this is a question of sovereignty that, that I don't think central banks are, uh, are going to, 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 to accept or even if this is a good idea, <laughs> just to, to, to be raised. But for sure, I think this is going to, to be discussed in our, in, our, in our discussion today. And the, 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 the last point that you make, it's very interesting. Ch China is our first mover. I think this is really very important because although technology, digital currencies are very important, if you ask me which is the force that will change the whole financial, international financial system, I think it has more to do with the opening of the capital account of China than to the technological and new products in the market. I think if you open the, the capital account of China, you will see a sea chain in the way the international finance work. But maybe this is another issue that we can discuss in a in another in another meeting. Uh, I'm going to give the floor now to Fanny Solano, which is the head of digital retail and market regulation in CaixaBank. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks to the Royal Institute for the invitation and thanks to Fabio Paneta, Margarita Delgado, and um, my previous panelists. Um, I have to say that I agree uh, with almost all the speakers uh, about what they have expressed uh, right now. And as Mr. Fabio Paneta points out in his speech, uh, we consider that banks have a role to play in the onboarding and the provision of front-end services. We think that banks, uh, uh, the role of banks have to be preserved as an intermediary because in sake of uh, financial stability, the user experience and also trust and uh, to maintain also the high efficiency of retail payments in the Eurozone. As we know, Europe is in the front of innovation for retail payments and banks especially has demonstrated that there are efficient in payment systems available and also throughout digital means. Therefore, I think that quality, accessibility, and trust should not be a challenge for banks participating in the digital euro. With respect of end user and the trust in the digital euro, uh, banks have been able to provide uh, retail payment services with high level of consumer protection, have the necessary know-how, and experience to deliver fast and consistent retail payments, also build them 
on trustworthy infrastructure, of course, with the coordination of the uh, public bodies and authorities. However, the quality, the trust, and the accessibility of the services on the digital euro will require a comprehensive discussion of the available options that we have in the industry, and also to see where are the different roles of the different players in this arena. For example, if we have a clear understanding of what is going to be the role of banks and for instance, we are going to be responsible of the identification of the users of the digital euro and will apply to transactions in digital euro similar requirements to those of the current anti-money laundering regulation. But the know your customer requirements uh, are to be complied in a different manner or in a different technical system. Uh, for instance, we have to see in detail how, how these rules will be governing those requirements and controls. Uh, we will need to have a clear understanding from the beginning and the allocation of responsibility and duties of each party participating and have to be properly defined. In addition, we have to see what is going to be the balance as uh, uh, Santiago also expressed between privacy and anonymity, and um, if it's going to be uh, um, the digital euro is really going to be a complement, not a replacement of the cash, this is going to be one of the key areas in which we will have to work. From a financial stability perspective, a digital euro real potential impacts on bank runs, uh, um, banks current uh, intermediary role on their function should be maintained, therefore we have to comprehensive analyze and take a careful approach of the role uh, of bank as intermediaries. All of those considerations led us to a conclusion that is key is that, and also Margarita has stated that, we have all to collaborate together and have a good communication uh, and help ECB um, to clearly define the roles of banks, payment institution, or other actors that we are expecting to play a role here. Uh, that role uh, has to be consistent also and coherent with the ECB design of digital euro and the infrastructure behind it. And the European institution, that is very important part, uh, initiative impacting the payments and financial services and through will have to be aligned with the, 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 the design of the digital euro. And in order to achieve that, any public initiative on digital identity, for example, and monetary policy decision will, will have to be considered and be coherent and comprehensive manner. Um, this continual cooperation will be necessary to overcome the challenge that you have raised that Mr. Fabio Panetta has pointed out. Um, those challenge uh, for developing an attractive business model for digital euro are dependent also on the player, for instance. In general terms, we all can agree that digital euro, um, uh, in order to ensure that digital euro is efficiently promoted, adopted and used, uh, by the different players, it is essential that it solves real problems. And Santiago raised out some points about if there are really real problems there and respond to a specific needs uh, in a different and um, more efficient way in which um, the ones that we are using right now and must be at least as attractive from a retail perspective from the <clears throat> payment system that we have already in place. So um, financial entities has invested a lot in innovative solutions and products. Therefore, the digital euro cannot replace private solutions and will not compete as Mr. Fabio Panetta expressed. So they will not be a discourage of innovation in the payment market if that is the case. As um, he also expressed, bank will be able to uh, offer services to retail customers, such the distribution of digital euro, uh, the custody of the services, and also the aggregation, so clients can have um, all the information in one picture about the financial access, including uh, digital euro. Another challenge is the regulatory one um, that should provide a competitive and fairly level playing field. Um, the ECB should clearly establish the same rules for the provisions of the same service regardless of the player. 
So here it's important to have in mind that the digital euro intermediation should be limited to regulate entities uh, that wants to maintain the intermediation of payment as they have been proved that they have expertise on those arena and they can do it with the protection of the customers and also uh, complying with the security, the transparency, uh, transparency and data access. And finally, and most important, the security of the current payment system to be preserved with or without the incorporation of new players. So uh, this is my statement. And finally, I have a question from uh, for Mr. Fabio Paneta is in relation, what are the expectations of the ECB in relation to the Digital Euro Market Advisory Board, what they are expecting in relation to the expert group, taking into account that um, I'm part, I'm going to start being part of the group. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Fanny. Very, very interesting. Uh, remarks. Uh, I keep the uh, take away, my takeaway will be three. The first that we need to have a clear assessment of the option and the players, the responsibilities and the duties. That means in fact how we design the framework in which this process is going to be uh, to be kick off and how how we have to handle in every every side of the of the of the play. I think it's very interesting the, your your point about the difference between privacy and anon anonymity. I think it's it's a key point that we will have to 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 to, to, to think over. Uh, and again, as Fabio make uh, in his remarks, what we need is to have a proposition value. <laughs> what this is going to to be do for for what. And what is the use of this? The, and I, I before uh, giving the floor to Alejandra, uh, this last point of leveling the playing field, I think it's something that maybe Alejandra is going to pick up. Uh, and I think it's also extremely important because we have to we have to, to to keep in mind that intermediaries are many, and not all of them are equally regulated and have the same the same rules. Alejandra, uh, as you know, it's uh, the head of research and public policy. Banco Santander, Alejandra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jose Juan. Thank you very much to Eltano for the invitation and to Mr. Paneta for being here today with us physically and for leading this effort in Europe. You speak passionately about the digital euro, Fabio, and, and, also, and, and, and also Margarita, by the way, and I think you are convincing us, no? I'm, I'm definitely convinced. <laughs> As at Santander, we believe it is very positive that the ECB explores the possibility of a digital euro. We understand the motivation for doing so, and you've spoken very clearly to that today, you know, the need for confidence, monetary policy uh, stability, payments efficiency, and also inclusiveness, as you mentioned. Um, I think it is great to count on banks uh, for, the, for the design. I am sure we will be able to contribute a lot, and here, finally, we count on you and many others in this, in this group that has been just set up. Um, I, uh, I probably... Maybe we want to accelerate time a little bit when we when we hear you know, all the expectations that we have on the digital euro and we think that we have a timeline of, of about seven years for, for it to be implemented if, if, if it was decided to do so. Um, seven years in the digital world sounds like so far and there's so much happening in the, in the payment. So as I was listening to, to you, um, I was thinking about, about this timing issue. But in any way, that's not, that's not the, the core of my, of my remarks today. Um, you have presented a very interesting uh, paradox, uh, Mr. Panetta and, and, and uh, Santiago referred to it too, no? of designing a euro, a digital euro, that it is attractive enough to be used as a means of payment, but not too attractive as a store of value as it would increase the risk of disintermediation. Um, I think um, Santiago has spoken a lot to that. So my only comment here is that when considering these risks in Europe, we of course have to take into account um, that credit to the non-financial sector in the Eurozone is almost twice as important for the economy as in the US. So the, I think the idiosyncrasy of our system uh, definitely um, has, to, has to be taken into account uh, there. No? And, and we, we will probably be very careful with, with the transition risks and I think also um, Margarita referred to that. Um, my second um, point is on making the digital euro an attractive as a means of payment. I think um, this this is exactly what we wanted for, not to be widely used as a digital form of cash. 
Um, and as you say, it will also provide a good platform for commercial banks to innovate, and this certainly motivates us. No? We like innovation, we like competition, and, and Fanny also referred to the role of, of banks here. Um, however, we, I think we are all aware, we will be add, adding disruption to an already very disrupted segment. So here we are um, seeing no, the huge growth of, of uh, digital payments, of digital purchases, and there's lots of statistics here. No? After the pandemic, for example, digital purchases in Spain have grown from 20 to 40 percent. Um, uh, use of cash has declined, and we also referred to that. Um, so digital behavior has really accelerated, no? and there's a lot changing in, in that space. In, in Spain, in fact, 20% of payments that we are processing today are direct payments, no, or peer-to-peer -peer payments. We have this Bithum uh, tool that is only five years old and it is being used by more than half of the bankrise population and occupying much more and more space in the payments area. So this is just to say that things are happening very quickly in this space. Um, it is also a very hot market for competitors, um, and you refer to, to competition. There's um, a lot of movements, a lot of non-bank players entering this space, um, and this is because it's a it's 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 you know it's a very interesting space, but it also generates a lot of data, right? And data is 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 critical. Um, it's critical also for credit. I was speaking yesterday with with uh, the people in our bank who run the the credit risk models, and they tell me that more than half of the data used in credit assessment comes from payments. So this is something that, that I think is very important in terms of thinking about uh, the digital euro in the future, its, it's usage and, and you know, uh, the, the access to, to data and how relevant that is. Um, as I say, lots of things happening in this space. I can mention just a few. I mean, WhatsApp has entered into some countries offering payments. In Brazil, for example, it's a big market. Big techs are assessing the possibility to launch stable coins. Have already announced, of course, uh, with Facebook the, the launch of DM cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin being uh, accepted in some cases as means of payments. The new form of financing payments are, is also important. It's changing. This idea of not buy now, pay later is, you know, growing a lot. So just to, you know, explain that this is really a, a hot, a hot space. Um, and now the digital euro. So the digital euro would, of course, transform the payments market. Um, it is very difficult to predict exactly how. Some surveys are telling us that digital euro could take a share of money in circulation between four and fifty-five percent. So, you know, there's there's a lot of uncertainty there. No. Um, it is also difficult to predict what the role of banks will be. We, of course, definitely want to be there. We want to distribute and offer value-added services, as Fanny said, to our customers based on the digital euro. And for this, um, I think three things we believe we need. No? First, we need the convincing value proposition. As Santiago and Fanny referred to that, that's very clear. Um, we need to provide a great customer experience. We need to make it easy for customers. We probably need to look at how to integrate everything in one solution. As Fanny said, we are all, some banks are, are working on the European Payments Initiative, which also has support from, from the, our public authorities. And uh, it, it, it would be very important that everything is integrated in, in, in one solution. We are investing a lot here, and I think that um, we need to make it first convenient to customers. Um, and second, of course, the business case has to work. Um, digital products and services do bear costs both related to um, onboarding of customers, AML, et cetera, no? but also to the infrastructure, the integration with existing systems. No? So we do need to find profitable business models um, to ensure that we all keep innovating and, investment in the develop and investing in the development of value-added services. Uh, Margarita, you mentioned programmability, and, and we definitely agree. I think we need to explore um, how to make um, the most of, of, of the possibilities that technology is offering us today. Um, and of course, programmability would allow us to embed the systems of, of AML controls, for example, and you know, things that I think would make this uh, much more efficient uh, for, for customers to use also. So this is the, the first ask would be to look, you know, let's all think together about the business case and the value proposition. I think this is important. Um, the second, on this debate about privacy and anonymity, I think this is crucial. Um, but it's also true, if we want the digital euro to be able to, to compete with, with others, we probably need um, to think about, first, how to use data to prevent fraud, of course, that's key. 
but possibly also we need to think about forms of asking if the customer wants to share the, his or her payments data so that the, the, um, we can continue to innovate and develop value-added services for our customers. It's very difficult to compete with, with stable coins if, there's not, um, if, if customers do not have the possibility voluntarily, of course, to share their, their data in return to value-added services. Um, and the third issue that I think would be important um, goes to the level playing field issue for uh, Juan. I think this is critical. Um, if we want, uh, we need to be very quick with regulatory reforms that ensure the level playing field with the new competitors that are entering into this space. Um, the digital euro is accelerating this, as I said, and, and will accelerate this. So, so I think, or would accelerate this. So I think we need to be very, you know, very quick in, in all these regulatory developments. We are seeing uh, progress in Europe, for example, with the Digital Markets Act. Um, the US, there's a lot of discussion here too, but there are still um, regulatory asymmetries that I think we need to take care of. I mentioned a lot. I mean, the PSD2, the Payments Directive in Europe, um, uh, uh, forces banks to share their data with their parties, and we think that's great because there's been a lot of movement and competition and, 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 and um, new initiatives coming out of that, that directive. But uh, we want this to be symmetrical. If we open data, we would probably need other non-bank players to also open their data in the benefit of competition. Um, there's many other issues in capital uh, rules, um, uh, even AML and consumer protection, uh, enforcement of these rules is different in, in our sector than in others. Um, operational resilience rules, including onboarding, um, supervision and regulation. There's lots of, of uh, symmetries there that I think we need to take care of. And my final, co my final comment would be on international coordination. Um, I think we need to uh, see, I mean, there's going to, there's so many central banks thinking about digital currencies, um, and I know that this is also a great concern to you, uh, Mr. Panetta. We will need to um, ensure that there is some form of coordination. My screen has gone, so I don't know if we're still online or not. And I'll stop speaking there. Thank you very much. No, you are online. Okay. You are online. Okay. Thank you, Alejandra. Uh, very interesting, the, the, the data you mentioned that 50% of the data that is included in the credit risk model comes from the payment system. That's a really very impressive number I, I didn't have in my mind. And here again, we have the three main comments that has been repeated by all the panelists. The, pro, the need to have a proposition value, the needs to be competitive, uh, and this means to, to deal very carefully with the idea of uh, privacy and anonymity, uh, the level in plain field. And now this, this idea that has also been raised by, uh, by all of you of the international coordination. Uh, I am going to give the floor to Carlos Huerpo, which is the General Secretary of the Spanish Treasury. Before that, uh, I remind the people who is uh, behind the, the screen that if you have any comment, any question, please send to actividades arroba rielcano uh, uh, Carlos, yes. you have the floor. Yes, thanks a lot, Juan, and thanks, Fabio, also for the invitation. Of course, it's a great pleasure to be here with such uh, distinguished panelists. Um, let me first put a bit of context uh, out of what Fabio was saying in terms of the current situation, in terms of the speed of the evolution of the, the whole digital innovation and, and digital currencies. So we know that it won't take a thousand years like for paper money. Uh, in the past, uh, it started in 2009, it gained track and over the past couple of years, it has increased exponentially. And we've seen that with uh, market uh, capitalization of those uh, firms. We've seen that with the number of digital currencies, the new users with stable coins. And we're seeing now parallel developments with, uh, with the central bank digital currencies, with the CBDCs. And um, just to put some numbers, um, there are now more than 80 central banks uh, actually thinking of their own uh, development of, of digital currencies. Uh, seven of them have already started, uh, starting with uh, Bahamas, if I'm not wrong, and some Caribbeans, and, and then the latest was Nigeria. Um, 17 of them are in a pre-implementation phase, out of which China, of course, as we already said, uh, is the biggest um, uh, country which is uh, ready to, to, to enter already into in 2022 in a full deployment phase. 
Um, so uh, this is uh, this is where we are, and uh, and and it is not waiting for any of us uh, uh, to, to 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 develop. Um, so in, in in this context, my my first point was also on the timing, as Alejandro was saying, on uh, on the potential advantages of an early implementation uh, versus um, and in order to provide with this early um, uh, implementation um, more. Um, let's say more leverage on determining the, uh, the standards also proper adaptation of the private sector and the citizen awareness uh, against other arguments related to properly weighting the technical complexities i think margarita was referring to it also regulatory concerns and data private privacy issues which are of course key i think here usability versus uh, control for example for, in terms of uh, anti-money laundering issues again uh, are very important things to, uh, to, to consider carefully. Uh, but at this stage, of course, um, it is important to get the discussion on the policy objective right. And I think uh, there, um, the, um, uh, the, the leading role of the ECB in terms of putting this subject on the table is, is, uh, is key. We have, um, uh, as a first element, um, to consider the trade-offs. I think Santiago was referring to the trade-offs between the different policy objectives in order to, uh, to make them explicit at uh, the first stage and then try to maximize, of course, the network effects while taking into account financial stability concerns and also data privacy issues. Um, of course, these network effects uh, will depend crucially on, on, on different features, which uh, we all know, like usability, interoperability, I think, which is also very important, innovation and, uh, and financial inclusion, to what extent we are able to, to get to, uh, to financial inclusion of, um, of debunked people. Um, on this, I would like to add um, three quick points. We have time also for, uh, for the discussion. Um, so the first one um, is on, on the European market and, and how the payments market and how it's becoming more dependent on both private sector and within the private sector on non-EU providers. Uh, here, I think that the broad use of credit cards, electronic money, mobile applications has accelerated the trend, uh, as you were also referring to it. And that means that the role of cash as the monetary anchor of, uh, of the payment system is diminishing. And the digital euro can be an answer, might provide an answer to, uh, to, to this situation, as, as Fabio was also mentioning. Uh, we need a world functioning monetary system that in terms uh, when itself needs uh, a monetary anchor that is provided by central bank. And on this, uh, I think I will echo Fabian and Margarita on our strong support uh, for, the, uh, for this road uh, towards a, a digital euro. Um, the second issue, um, and I think uh, potentially it, it, it was discussed by many of you, um, is the role of cash and how it is evolving in, in this, let's say, a binary role as means of payments and, and store of value and how um, we can um, pinpoint the exact uh, situation or the exact incentives for the digital euro to come by or to get inserted as a, as a means of payment, as a substitution of the declining role of cash, but without getting too many incentives in order to, to, to get uh, an excessive role in terms of, uh, of store of value. I think here, potentially we'll have the discussion on, on the specific instruments that can be discussed in order to tilt those incentives. And, and some of them have already been uh, uh, on the table, like caps or interest rates or others, which I think are also part of the, of the discussion at, at this stage. Um, third argument would be a uh, point on the need for uh, an efficient public-private collaboration. I think uh, many of you also raised that issue. Um, here for the, for the digital euro to succeed, we need uh, that financial intermediaries actually take, uh, undertake key functions in, in the system. The experience of experts uh, will be key. And here I think the, the introduction of the, of the advisory group is, a, is an excellent idea where you, you can get uh, opinions from the private sector, and, and, and aside from the, the insights uh, from, from private experts, I think uh, financial institutions would be a key player in the implementation. Uh, the Blue Connect, and I think this argument was also raised, uh, that the core system of the central bank with end users. So uh, they are linked to the European pay payment system, which is again uh, a, a must uh, if we want it to succeed. So just to, to conclude, at present, I think we are aware of the many technical, uh, economic and legal aspects uh, which are uh, ahead of us uh, in order to have a successful project. But uh, uh, it is a very disruptive 
project. And we are designing it, you are designing it from scratch in a sense. So uh, it just gives an idea of the uh, overarching uh, goal that we all aim at uh, achieving. And, and in this sense, I think we all wanted to, to succeed and, uh, and, and, and race has started. So I, I close with my remark that we as Europeans must, must make sure that uh, we do not lag behind and, and keep somehow a leading role on, on the digital front also within uh, the, the financial uh, sector and initiatives. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think it's uh, very clear your numbers on the where we are in the process are really very impressive. Uh, I think uh, also it's a very impressive the idea that uh, the timing is key to be a first mover. Uh, I think it uh, has very clear advantages, although as you have raised, there are trade-offs. Uh, we have to, to, to be very careful, uh, uh, analyze very carefully the, the situation. And the idea of cooperation between the private and the private sector, Fabio, I think, has been one of the main conclusions of this panel. Uh, some of the panelists have raised uh, some specific question. I think uh, I will give you back the floor to, to react. Yeah, to yeah. the and some of the question. And if uh, so, the people who are behind the screen uh, have some some question, please send to actividades arroba rielcano.org. Fabio, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jose Juan, and many thanks for the many uh, useful uh, observations, questions, and suggestions. They are certainly uh, very valuable, and uh, I took good note, and uh, my collaborators did even better uh, job than me. Um, uh, uh, starting from, from uh, your comments, Margarita, I think that you mentioned the, uh, some key uh, you know, elements of the project. This is, as uh, uh, Carlos also mentioned, a potentially disruptive project. And uh, we feel this because when we interact with uh, um, I happen to chair the European Retail Payment Board, which we have uh, banks, uh, payment companies, uh, consumers association, and they are very worried. It's, a, it's a, a challenging task to explain them what's going on and to explain them that, for example, nobody will be uh, deprived of means of payment. We're not going to withdraw cash. And the banks uh, uh, want to be assured every time we meet that uh, Banks will be part of the picture, but of course, of course. Um, uh, we have to use the art of communication very, very nicely. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but uh, I'm, I'm serious, no? Because uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I have uh, several um, um, counterparties and uh, even individual citizens writing me on a recurrent basis to be reassured because I, I've said, I think, one zillion times uh, that we will not withdraw cash, but I'm available to confirm every time that I meet with consumers. But my mother wants to be the sure every time well, she knows what I do, she, but should I have cash? Yeah, we'll have cash. So, I mean, <laughs> I, and uh, I, I know that this is a sensitive issue, and it is, uh, you know, I mean, communication is key, explaining what we are doing, explaining that the central bank, for example, this is an issue that came in uh, different comments. The central bank is not even dreaming of replacing the private sector. I was giving uh, today a, a number when I was speaking with uh, uh, Miguel. But there are in uh, the euro area 2.3 million uh, bank employees. So there's no way that uh, central banks, the most 50,000, could do the job that today 2.3 uh, million people are doing. So we, we don't even dream to do that. But this needs to be explained also because you have the plans and then you have the unintended consequences. And uh, we are, and uh, uh, many refer to this, uh, 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 also Carlos in his comments, we have to discuss very carefully the safeguards that we are, uh, um, you know, in order to avoid that the project uh, ends uh, uh, with a, a reduction of the, or instability in uh, the banking sector. So we will certainly, certainly pay a lot of attention to explaining our, our project. And also, because this has become the most popular, sometimes even more popular than more than policy topic in, in the discussion. <laughs> and uh, and uh, 
Um, uh, then uh, uh, going to comments on cash. Is it cash really uh, disappearing? Uh, yes, and if not, doesn't change much. Why is it disappearing? Uh, cash is, uh, the, the, the use of cash in transactions is uh, uh, falling in all countries. But uh, it is not necessarily related, the, the decline in the use of cash to preferences. Uh, suppose that, uh, you know, in 20 years from now, 90% of our purchases would be online. How do you, cash, do you use cash online? If in 20 years from now, we buy 80% uh, of our goods from, I don't will not uh, name the company, from one large company that is able to uh, deliver on a daily basis, no? My, my kids buy, they get the stuff at, uh, in the early afternoon in Rome. And for me, that's science fiction, but they do it. But <laughs> in 20 years from now, if uh, commerce would be mainly online, and not only the big text, they will be able to do it. Because I see also my, my, my grocery in Frankfurt brings me uh, uh, the stuff I buy by, by internet. So how do you pay with it? So cash, in my view, uh, will necessarily decrease as a physiological development of a digital economy, not necessarily in payments, but as a reflection of the digitalization. But suppose that cash uh, uh, is still uh, uh, held as a store of value. Uh, what I try to argue in my comment that even if the demand of cash were to uh, uh, persist, because people want to uh, store value through cash, then this will not be sufficient because if uh, people don't use cash as a means of payment, sooner or later, they will stop using cash as store of value or uh, as a union account. Why? Well, why do people uh, uh, use cash as a store of value? Because they know that the day in which they need cash, they can spend it. I suppose that cash cannot be spent. How do we know that cash will be demanded as a store of value? I would not uh, store value in something that I cannot use the following day. So if cash becomes impossible to be used as a means of exchange, are we sure that cash will be uh, uh, demanded as store of value? My conjecture, and in the in the speech, I give uh, examples. One example I will give to you: the changeover, the changeover from the, the national currencies to the euro. Um, in those three years, uh, we were not using uh, cash in euro. We were using pesetas, lira, whatever, Deutsche marks, and uh, no company started to write its balance sheet in euros. Only after, only after the introduction of the euro cash, people started to think in terms of euros. Once they could uh, you know, uh, have the cash in their head, they understood we were different. Or, uh, I, I stop it, but in, in, the, in the speech, you have other examples also in, in history. But this is, a, a, in my view, a, a big risk. Uh, we don't use uh, uh, sovereign money as a digital uh, means of payment. Sooner or later, we will not use it as a store of value and as a unit of account. So even if it is not going to disappear, but my conjecture is that it will because of digitalization, this will not jeopardize the project because eventually the demand would uh, uh, disappear. On uh, privacy, anonymity, well, first, let's distinguish uh, anonymity from confidentiality. Uh, the, the digital euro, the introduction of the digital euro, other things being equal, will improve confidentiality, will not decrease. There's no way it decreases. Why? First, because all the options which are available today, if to to uh, buy uh, or to do payments anonymously, will still be available. You will be still uh, able, if people demand it, to use cash. And you can be as anonymous today as you will be in the future after the digital euro. There will be no withdrawal of cash unless people decide they don't want to hold cash. But in that case, that's a choice. But uh, then let's look at the cross-sectional comparison. Uh, today, we are already using digital means of payment. I use my credit card. I use uh, apps. But those, number, those data that I uh, provide in this way are clearly used by the, the provider of those services. Uh, Alejandra was mentioning that 50%, uh, I'm surprised at only 50%. Uh, by, by uh, you know, example, can, can give you an example. If you uh, 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 learn from my credit card that I buy healthy food versus junk food, 
then you would be able to, if you are an insurance company, for example, to price your uh, insurance policy much better to me because if I buy, if I eat junk food, the probability of become ill in the future for some illness related to the, to the fat is much higher than if you buy broccoli. I don't buy broccoli, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, and then uh, or and this applies also. Uh, suppose that you are a platform and you observe that a company is selling its products uh, on the platform and it sells a lot highly successful, much more than its competitors, then you would lend that company at a lower rate because it's less risky than another company that in the same platform cannot sell <laughs> anything. So uh, those data are already used uh, without any control. The central bank will not do it because uh, my objective is not to do profits, not to exploit the data that we would eventually have uh, because we would have access to data on the digital euro to make profits, that we are a public institution, our uh, goals are goals of public interest. No, uh, if we do profits, we're happy, but that's not the objective of, of the house. So uh, by having a public institution manage operating a digital uh, 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 payment system, privacy is better protected than uh, by having a, a private uh, player doing so. And um, on, on the on the and then the, you don't need to introduce anonymity. Why should we introduce anonymity? Maybe, but this is not going to be. Let me be very frank. This is not going to be a choice by the centre bank. We will present our proposal, but this is a discussion for the core legislators at the European level, Commission, Parliament, uh, Council. Uh, I don't see personally a, a urgent need to guarantee anonymity with cash and with uh, digital euro because uh, anonymous. Uh, uh, purchases can already be done, and we should guarantee confidentiality, uh, protection of data, and knowing and explaining to the users that they would improve their situation vis-a-vis -vis the provider of digital payment services. Uh, on uh, stable coins, uh, um, you know, stable coins are not money. They cannot be money. Even with the best possible regulation, they cannot be money because the money, my view, must be, not in my view, in, in the, by the, its uh, the very definition, must be a safe asset. You want to be sure that, uh, you know, 100 euro today stored in money is 100 euro tomorrow, and 100 euro in a year from now. And in order to guarantee this with banks, we use the number of uh, public policy safeguards, no? Bank supervision, capital uh, requirements, deposit guarantee schemes, and, even this way, from time to time, you see that you know people do have uh, concerns about the the the, the, the value of, of in crisis times. For example, a stable coin uh, will have a you know its reserve assets invested by definition in low risk assets, but they can be low risk but not riskless. So they cannot be money, and you can regulate them to uh, make them. Uh, I see them as a sort of uh, mutual fund. You can have them very close to a money market mutual fund, but cannot be money. And when people were convinced in the US before the financial crisis that the money market mutual funds were uh, like money, we know how it uh, ended yeah. Okay? Yeah. with systemic implications because people were running from the money market because they were, were perceived. They could write checks on the money market mutual funds and then it did not end up uh, very well to use a, a euphemism. On um, uh, uh, the legal basis, uh, uh, you know, the analysis of that I have, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but the analysis we have are uh, undisputable. Uh, there would be need for legislative changes. There is discussion uh, among lawyers on the legal basis, Article 127, Article 133, which would enable a legislation, but I take for granted that there would uh, be a necessity of, of uh, uh, legislative changes. It, will that be possible? Well, uh, the only problem I have when I interact with uh, the co-legislators, uh, with Carlos and other uh, uh, colleagues from the, the member states, is that they want the ECB to be faster. So I, I cannot expect uh, the member states, the, the, the commission, the council, to ask us to be faster and not want to introduce new legislation. Um, I don't think this would be a controversial uh, legislation. Well, on, on, the, on, on the details, of course, we'll uh, endless discussions, okay, but uh, on the need to do so in, in a fast and efficient way, I, I, I do not, uh, may, I may be naive, but I, I, 
I think there will be uh, you know, a common view that this needs to be done. On um, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, fact that uh, we should have supervised intermediaries, yes, we have said this several times, uh, but supervised intermediaries doesn't mean necessarily only banks. Mm -hmm. Or it does not mean uh, only them. There are other intermediate payment institutions which are regulated. Uh, which are, then there are a number of uh, competitive issues that are hard to mention. But now we are deviating for the digital euro. I understand that the, the banks uh, uh, have their uh, uh, views on the the unlevel benefit, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that this depends on the digital euro. Will not be made better or worse by the digital euro. Uh, I can agree on some dimensions. I would disagree on others, but uh, I hope that uh, 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 I will be invited by Jose Juan for another discussion that I have a chance to come to. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on um, uh, uh, the, 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 the duration of the project, the, the time uh, necessary. So it's long. It's not seven years. We, we are suggesting five years, still long. Um, but uh, let's face it. Um, the Chinese started in 2013, and uh, uh, up to now, until now, they do not have uh, the digital RMB available. They are doing some uh, um, uh, testing in uh, local communities. They might have a big uh, test in, on the occasion of the Winter Olympics uh, next year but they are not ready yet and they have been working for almost 10 years. The second most advanced uh, central bank is Sweden, central bank of Sweden, Riksbank. Riksbank started in 2017 and they uh, have made uh, statements that they would expect to have something which is close to be the final part in 2026. Uh, so we are planning 2026. They are planning the same with uh, four years more work. I hope we are not too ambitious. But uh, uh, here there should be no discussion. It is not that we believe that we can take this, can do this slowly. We are proceeding full speed. It's a big, it's a big project. Uh, uh, you know, everybody has suggested a very uh, reasonable thing. You should be interoperable with power payment solutions. But we have 19 countries and more than 19 different credit cards and, and card schemes, not just uh, credit card schemes. And uh, if we want to be interoperable with each and every one of them, given that the EPI is a fantastic initiative, but the EPI is no product. Um, when I go to the, the, the Euro Working Group and Euro Group, yeah, will you be interoperable with the EPI? Maybe when we will see what the EPI will uh, propose as a product, I will tell you, because you know, I get you know, the usual uh, question, I, I provide the usual answer. Uh, we are uh, you know, um, working with the EPI, by the way, we are pushing the EPI. It's not a secret that uh, Valdis Dombrowski and myself forced the EPI to sign the agreement last year in July, because otherwise uh, the EPI will be still discussing. And they are still discussing. So when the EPI will come with the product, um, by the way, the banks that are part of the EPI are largely represented in the market. So yes, we will do as much as possible to be interoperable with everybody, uh, especially with pan-European payment schemes. But, we need a counterparty and happy to inform you when we will be able to have this uh, discussion. On the MAG, uh, uh, we, we expect a lot. We have tried to select the best experts. We have, uh, given that we really uh, uh, consider very important to um, offer a, a digital unit that is interoperable with uh, a private payment solutions, we have formed a, a group of experts at the European level. I don't know how many, 30, 40 persons? Sure. 30, okay. Uh, finally has been selected, so congratulations, because many people have selected the best experts, okay? And why we do that? Because if you want to be operable with, uh, with uh, that one, I would need to talk with him. So we talk with the banks and we will have, I think this week you have the first meeting, right? We will have the, 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 the first meeting and we will ask, uh, what are the standards? What are the, the and we will get into highly be ready. You should work for me. I will check if you do. Uh, <laughs> work very hard to uh, uh, help us in designing a product that is indeed interoperable. So the expectation on my is very high now and uh, jokes apart because uh, uh, the, the central bank does not have uh, a long tradition 
not even a short tradition in providing retail means of payment. So we need to talk with those who do have this, this expertise. And the MAG will be instrumental in building this link between uh, digital euro and the, uh, the market. Um, and then, uh, you know, the paradox that we are facing has been mentioned several times. We, on the one hand, face the risk of, of being too successful, what does too successful mean, that you know, we provide something which is uh, very attractive, that people could shift from bank deposits to the digital euro, especially in crisis time. So we would be making digital bank runs more likely, and this would be a problem. At the same time, we run the risk of being not enough successful, because the question is uh, very important. Why should I shift from a credit card to a digital euro? Of course, the easy way out, which we are not uh, uh, betting on that, is legal tender. Because uh, you know, in order to be successful as a payment instrument, you need to build the network effects. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you're, but uh, the experience of cash is telling us that even if you are legal tender, but the means of payment is not attractive, people will not want to hold. So we have to build a valuable, a valuable uh, uh, product. Um, there will be advantages. Um, the central bank doesn't charge the cost of producing banknotes. So we may decide not to charge, but of course, if you don't charge, you don't want to be disruptive with uh, the private uh, uh, players who do charge for, uh, uh, to offer, in order to make their products available. So we will have to strike a fine equilibrium, and this is the, the challenge we are facing. But we will uh, uh, certainly, be uh, as respectful as possible of competition, but at the same time, we do want to change the degree of competition in this market. <clears throat> uh, Carlos has mentioned that you know, a handful of uh, private uh, companies has a very large market share in retail payments in Europe. You know, the, 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 the two card schemes uh, and the international ones plus one um, PayPal, I don't know how to call it, uh, they hold, they, they uh, 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 mother for 70% of card payments in the euro area. So there's a huge market power. We do not want to create, um, you know, uh, tensions for those who are competing in the market, but if there's an excessive market power, the digital euro may be uh, useful also because uh, I'm not sure that all European banks will be able to compete in case a big tech comes or with the very large international card scheme, maybe if they have a digital product that they can use to build on top of it uh, innovative uh, uh, services, no? uh, smart contracts, uh, programmable uh, payments, uh, or uh, you mentioned giving information on the state of, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the definition I usually give of the digital euro is raw material. We offer to the banks the raw material then it's up to you to compete on who will give them. You are now competing uh, by giving your services. You will be, I hope, competing on building additional services on top of the digital euro. This is the maximum level. Of a, a small cooperative bank from a rural area uh, uh, throughout Europe, everywhere in Europe, could not compete with a large bank or with a, 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 a stable coin or with uh, the international card schemes. But maybe that they can compete a little bit compete a little bit better if they have this input with this additional means of payment that would come from the public sector for uh, macroeconomic stability reasons for this is reason that I, I, I mentioned uh, before. Um, on timing, uh, Carlos, I think I, 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 it is true that there are a few central banks that have already issued their digital, some of those are not digital currencies. They are uh, um, apps to move quickly money from one bank to the other, which is a useful uh, uh, service, but it's not a CBDC. CBDC, which I argued is the peculiar element of the payment system, which is ne necessary to guarantee equilibrium in, in the payment and financial sector, is central bank money. That's commercial bank money. And uh, even if uh, uh, Bahamas or Nigeria were to offer a, a CBDC, that would hardly be the standard. No, let's face it. Then, of course, then we have uh, China. Uh, but there could be a cost in being a latecomer. There could be a cost in being the first one leading the, 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 the queue because uh, um, uh, I'm part of a broader cooperation effort at the, the Bank for International mm -hmm. Settlement. We are uh, uh, cooperating in a group which includes the ECB, 
uh, Fed, uh, Swiss National Bank, uh, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, the Federal Reserve, Bank of Canada, and the Miss One because we are eight. I'm sorry. The eight is where? Well, eh? I said that. I said, I, anyway, we are eight. <laughs> but the large central banks, which represent you know, 70% of world GDP, we are cooperating. We are, I should say, with Sweden, the most advanced one. Mm -hmm. We were late comers, we are running fast. <laughs> and um, if we set the standard, and there's a large central bank that was first to rush to issue its standard, if they don't talk to each other, who will have problem, mm -hmm. uh, problems? I, I don't know. Um, there's a cost in being uh, last, there's a cost of being first. Uh, don't know how this works out uh, in the end. And um, I think I addressed some of the, if, uh, I'm sorry if I forgot oh, something, but no, thank you. Thank you very much. We are nearly 40 minutes past our allocated time. Oh, yeah, sorry. Therefore, <laughs> that's what sorry. proof it, this is a fascinating topic that we have to continue. I was kind of <laughs> You are invited to come back here and to, to, to have new meetings. Uh, and to allocate to this uh, fascinating uh, idea and topic uh, the time that it deserves. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you to all. I think already, thank you, Miguel, for the excellent cooperation we had. Very nice uh, being here and discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All, all, all the panelists, thank you very much. And now, if you want to join us to have a coffee, uh, yes, that would be great for us. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And we close now the the, the, the transmission. I don't know if I have to do it. <laughs>